Good morning. Isn't it great to be around so many friends and colleagues who are all gathered here to celebrate innovation in the state of Connecticut, and especially around here at Yale and New Haven? And welcome to Yale. It's a great day to be here. It's supposed to be good weather, so we're still working on that. Um, but this is our fifth annual Innovation Summit. Um, and I just thought it would be useful just to track where we've been. Because five years ago, there were about 200 of us in this room. This year, we had 1,250 plus registrations for this meeting. Is that not phenomenal? I mean, that's, a, that's an indication of what's going on in this state. Now, one of the questions that I get asked all the time is, is how do I get to meet you know, investors who might be interested in my idea, or I get investors who say, I want, to get, I want to find out what kind of cool stuff is going on around Yale and in Connecticut. And so this is actually that opportunity to get together. So for those of you who came here hoping to meet with other investors, there's 160 different investment funds represented in this day today, 160. And for you investors who are looking for things, we have everything from ideas that are in the embryonic stage to companies that have already gotten seed funding that are actually looking for series A's and B's. And so I want you to recognize that those opportunities are here. And the only thing that's standing between the two of you is meeting up. All right. So during the course of this day, my hope would be that everybody would meet up. And especially at lunchtime during the breaks, we have this beautiful courtyard that we can use. Um, there will be plenty of opportunities for people to get together and connect um, because, after all, that's what this day is all about for us. Now, there are a couple of things that I have to do um, for bookkeeping and other reasons, um, but one of the things I have to make people aware that there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes to make something like this happen. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of work that this takes to make this a premier event. Um, everything from making sure that your name badges get printed, because if you were here last year, you remember how tough that was, but we got that fixed this year, um, to having this booklet printed up, to having the, the web decks uh, or event decks app working, all those things. And my office has worked very hard to make all these things go, and I could sit here and try to introduce you to all my office, but that would take too long. But there's one guy in particular because of the level of effort that he has put in, I want to recognize first, and because he always is up here giving these sort of operational announcements before anybody's sitting down paying attention, I just want to recognize Tim Opstra. Thank you. <laughs> but there's another reason why this doesn't come off without a lot of help, and that's from our sponsors. And so I particularly want to recognize um, our sponsors. And there, this year is a little different than we've ever done before, um, and it's because of the partnership that we formed with Connecticut Innovations a number of years ago, but has really blossomed and grown over the last year. So this year we're doing something very, very different. We're actually giving them one of our tracks, um, and they're going to be meeting upstairs with certain companies that have been uh, spun out of Yale, spun out of other parts around the area, and my good friend Matt McCooey, who is going to stand up because I told him he's going to stand up so I could recognize him, the CEO of Connecticut Innovations. But we have other sponsors as well. We have gold sponsors, Saul Ewing and Shipman and Goodwin and Wigan and Dana, people that we deal with every day, and they are great partners for us to be with. And our silver sponsors, Royalty Pharma, Goodwin Law, Elm Street Ventures, Merck, Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, uh, Fiona Della, Milone, and La Sarsarina, uh, Klein Hirsch, and Elm City Innovation Collaborative. If you'd join me in giving them all a round of applause. <laughs> now, there's a, one other group that I have to thank, and it's the group that allows us to use this fantastic facility, and that is the Yale School of Management. Um, we have started using this right after the building opened. They've been gracious enough to let us use it. There are certain rules that you have to follow. No coffee here, only water. No food down here. Um, but if you just be respectful of the facility, um, it's truly one of Yale's premier venues, and we want to keep using it for a while. So if you would help us with that, we'd uh, appreciate that. But uh, we give special shout out to the School of Management for all the help and support they give us because it's a ton, 
It really is, and it helps make this a great event. All right, so let's get on with the show. Um, we are, um, this is something that's totally off book, so if you're reading the, the uh, program, this is not on the book, um, but it, is, it goes with the theme of the day, and the theme of the day is relationships, because for us, it's the only way that we get our job done. Um, it's building those relationships, it's sustaining the relationships, it's strengthening the relationships over time. And this day is part of that entire effort. Uh, so what we, we have built the entire program around that theme of building relationships, building connections. But there's one particular relationship that we have been forging um, that's very special to us because it's the new governor of the state of Connecticut, Ned Lamont. Um, we are blessed to have him present with us today. It's not on the program, but I've asked him if he would be willing to, to share a few words with us about what he sees in terms of the innovation ecosystem that is building, strengthening, and sustaining the state of Connecticut. Governor. Good morning, everybody. Um, the other relationship which I'm fostering is I am the trailing spouse to Annie Lamont, who's going to be speaking in a few minutes, a relationship I pay close attention to. Um, and John, uh, you know, last night we had a sort of introductory uh, dinner uh, in, in and around the life sciences. We did it over the Peabody Museum, surrounded by um, archaic bones. So I think this is a sort of contemporary place to talk about what we've got to do uh, as a state going forward. And uh, also, in terms of those 140-plus funders who are here, um, I know a lot of the entrepreneurs, they love Connecticut. They really want to stay in Connecticut. So keep that in mind as you uh, cross paths. Um, I just want to say one thing about Connecticut, because it's a bit of a um, hidden gem in this sense. Uh, Forbes just um, said that we are the fourth most innovative state in the country. And that takes a lot of people by surprise because they think of a lot of our old industries. We've been making helicopters and submarines and, you know, Stanley Black and Decker tools going back over 150 years. And if you go to the northern part of the state in particular, you're going to find these are places everything is moving towards computer aided. We're trying to do our best to introduce young people to what the next generation of advanced manufacturing jobs are. And while uh, we may not have a Silicon Valley here, we are the advanced manufacturing of, uh, we are the Silicon Valley of advanced manufacturing. And part of the story we have is we make sure that the incredible talent that we have here in Connecticut stays and grows here. In the uh, totally opposite side of the state, down uh, in Stanford area, uh, where I'm from, uh, it's a different story. You think about that as all finance and UBS and RBS, and yep, that's, that's part of the story there. But what really is uh, transforming in uh, that part of the state is uh, digital media and social media. You know, from Indeed and Priceline uh, to um, uh, Blue Sky Digital, which did Ice Age, the whole studios there, um, NBC Sports. And I was just sort of intrigued to find out the other day that the whole UBS trading floor, next time you're back here in a year or two, is going to be the largest digital media production studio in the world when WWE takes it over, which they've scheduled to do. Just to give you an idea of some of the innovation and changes that are happening in the state. And the final thought I just leave you with is um, right here in New Haven, in Yale New Haven, and uh, how important uh, life sciences is to the future of the state. And uh, what we're doing every day, I was just there clipping the ribbon for the new neuroscience building, uh, what we have in terms of uh, you know, the quantum physics and the energy there and AI and uh, immunology. Connecticut is going to be a leader in these areas and uh, where what, you know, computer science was for Stanford and Silicon Valley in the last generation, I'd like to think that Yale and Yale New Haven in this corridor is absolutely going to be the center of 21st century life sciences. And my job as a freshly minted governor of all of 110 days is to make sure we put in place the infrastructure that allows all that to happen. And that starts, uh, in some ways, with an honestly balanced budget, something we've been woefully without for a long time. Uh, we just got our uh, upgrade from S&P, so we're making progress there. It uh, also means transportation. It's just incredible to me that it takes longer to get from New Haven to New York or New Haven to Boston today than it did 15 years ago, longer than it did to, uh, over 100 years ago. 
And shame on us, because Connecticut's strategic location with New Haven right here in the hub has got to be so core to where we go uh, in the future. And um, those are some of my priorities. And I'll just tell you that um, it's, it's fun for me being back here. I was the third graduating class at SOM. It was a, a program of where we always thought the public and the private had a lot to learn from each other. And in my world, I had the a great opportunity to start up a telecommunications business soon after I left uh, SOM. But always, uh, I always had the time to have one foot in the public sector, and, um, and now I'm doing what I'm doing up in the governor's residence. So um, we're just proud to be able to reintroduce uh, Connecticut to you and everything we're doing here. We want to make sure this is a place you can call home as well. Thanks, everybody. All right, now we're back on book. Um, so we're going to do things a little differently this morning with our, our opening keynote. Uh, and I'm going to introduce to you um, the two presenters. Moira Forbes, who serves as the executive vice president of Forbes Media, where she is responsible for driving new business initiatives across the country, across companies' diverse media platforms, and branding Ford events worldwide. She's also the president and publisher of Forbes Women, a multimedia platform de dedicated to successful women. And if you didn't participate in the Women in Biotech or the other briefings that we had, we are really uh, emphasizing that. Um, but apart from hosting success of Moira Forbes, a video series on Forbes Video Network featuring candid one-on-one -on -one interviews with today's top women leaders, Moira also writes a dedicated leadership column for Forbes.com profiling today's most dynamic women's leaders. I'm going to introduce Moira, and I'm also going to introduce our keynote, but the governor has already done that in a sense, and that's Annie Lamont. Um, and I've actually had the good fortune of actually having met with her. She actually uh, invested in one of the very first ventures I actually was involved with with David Shear when I first came to Yale. Um, she's the co-founder and managing partner of Oak HCFT, uh, and Annie has more than 30 years of experience as a venture capitalist. She is indeed the first lady of venture investing, and we are so proud to have her here today with us. Thank you, Moira and Annie. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am so thrilled to be here, and I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to, to speak with Annie. For those of you who don't know Annie, she is one of the most formidable forces in the venture arena, the healthcare arena, the fintech arena. She's someone, as you heard, who has over 30 years of experience investing in transformative companies and entrepreneurs. And she's built her career on picking winners and identifying opportunities, blending her expertise of healthcare and financial services technology. So Annie, thank you. And, thank and you. hearing your husband, the governor, speak and, and being next to you, I'm so grateful when we think about the big challenges uh, that we face in our communities, in our states, in government, in big sectors like healthcare. Seeing both of you, I'm reminded uh, how lucky we are when we have extraordinary talent tackling um, these big, messy problems and talent also represented in this room that have the opportunity to really sh reshape uh, and positively impact the future for, for so many people. So thank Thanks, you, Annie. Thank you. Um, I want to start off because you've had a really interesting career trajectory in venture, um, really in the very nascent stages of the venture industry, and particularly in the nascent stages of the healthcare uh, uh, intersection with that field. So rewind the, the clock and talk a little bit about about some of the early steps that, that you took in your career and the pivotal turning point that you saw in the late 1990s mm -hmm. that really shaped the foundation in which your investing approach um, and how you look at the opportunities have been shaped today. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great, great to be here and thanks for doing this, Maura. Um, so I, um, along with David Shearer, who's in this room, um, had invested in biotech over, my, uh, over a period of 15 years. Um, and in the late 90s, if you recall, um, the venture industry on bi around biotechnology had had the wind behind its back. It was a, an amazing place to be. Um, everybody had this you know, sort of assumption that biological sciences versus the old uh, drugs, you know, chemicals, um, would, you know, every drug would work. Um, and so, you know, we had a, a great run, um, and then you, you know, you come to the late 90s, um, and you find that the, um, 
with the, you know, essentially there were 2,000 biotech companies at that point, and there were 12 drugs, I think, approved out of all of those companies. So you could see sort of the headwinds at that moment in time. You also had, if you think about 98, 99, you know, the advent of the internet. And um, so that was a moment in time where everyone was focused really on um, the mania around, you know, the internet revolution. Um, and so it was a combination of sort of that, uh, the winds moving against sort of biotech at that moment, um, and this is, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit, I think, later in, in the talk, um, is, you, you know, part of what you do in biotech is you, you have to be thinking about the macro factors that affect the industries that you're investing in. Um, and it became clear to me at that point that um, two things, you know, one, that the winds were going to be against and they were for the next decade of biotech investing, um, and two, that with the advent of the internet, you had a healthcare system that was broken, um, and you had the, we were 20 years behind the financial services industry, for example, uh, in terms of um, investment in IT and the internet. Um, and so I got excited in 2000 uh, about two things. One, thinking about um, technology-enabled solutions in healthcare, uh, and you know, I love, I mean, investment in drugs, we, you know, we're, we're, we all benefit from that. We're going to be benefiting from that. Please, please do something in Alzheimer's. I'm very, like, everybody in my family has had it. Um, but but the, as I think about, you know, life going forward, I really wanted to focus on lowering costs and improving quality. And you had to go systemically at that. Uh, and so our entire mission changed in around 2000 as we thought about how, how to do that. And so we, we shifted to uh, technology-enabled solutions in healthcare. Um, and simultaneously, I had done some dabbling. And if you think about 98, 99, what was going on, um, you know, you had companies that, it was, it was a mania, which was great, because you funded companies like Amazon and Google. But you also, um, you know, you funded, a, there were a lot of crazy companies. Um, and venture capitalists were literally making you know, 50 and 100 times on their money on things that were two years later didn't exist. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I was in, had invested in a few things like Flues, which is one of the sort of first cryptocurrencies online with Whoopi Goldberg, uh, and, but actually touched payments. I, you know, I realized that I was touching payments and was working on things like PayPal and others and looking at the explosion and, and started thinking about the convergence of payments, rev cycle management. You know, if you think about healthcare, it's a lot about sort of claims, billing, payments, financial alignment. I uh, ended up starting, you know, sort of literally taking a year and a half off from investing and thinking about where the world was going and started the FinTech group practice also. And that's really how it came together as we thought about the convergence of those industries, what was happening with the internet and how we thought about our strategy. And before I want to talk about that process yeah. of how you evolved and the time that you took off, you've talked about sort of some of the investments that didn't work out, um, but that were fundamental in, in shaping the course yeah. that you took. And you've talked about one investment, which is a, was a roll up of physicians. And, yeah. and, and that really sort of defined yeah. eventually what you didn't want to do. And you have stayed so true to this mission of investing in companies that lower cost and improve care um, and create value in the system. And while we think that's intuitive that every everyone should do that, there are many opportunities where you can make money short term, but but you're only exacerbating the problems in the system. Talk talk how that evolved yeah, yeah. for you and that very that very singular focus. Sure. No, I mean it seems so basic, right? Well of course you want to lower cost and improve quality, but so but if you actually look at what private equity is doing, that really isn't the focus. It's really about how can I build, how, how can I drive fee for service to make as much money as possible? Um, how can I aggregate assets to do that to get leverage? Um, and that is not what we want to do. Um, and so during the '90s, we funded a number of service companies. The first for-profit hospice company, uh, the first for-profit, well, the first venture-backed Medicaid HMO, actually. Um, and, but we funded another company uh, that was an orthopedic roll-up. Um, and there were two public companies at that time that were aggregations of physicians. Um, and the, you know, the theory was at that time that you would apply uh, you know, IT and consolidate back office and that you would, you would in some way add value to the physicians. But the reality of it was that it was a stock play. And it really, and it was what the, the physicians looked at it as a stock play also in that you, know, you would you would pay them for their practice, you would give them shares in the newly formed entity, and you would go public, and the reality was that they, you know, that the stock would, would run, and it, you know, it was really a financial play at the end of the day. 
Um, and because the, the corporate entity was not really one, adding value to the physician's life, and two, wasn't adding value to the patients. There was, uh, in the end, there weren't information systems that were sophisticated enough at that time to really help these, uh, the physician practices, and there really wasn't the, the value being delivered. And, and mostly, if the incentive is, in the end, the, the doctors think this is all about making money, it, that isn't the, a sustainable uh, program. And so, just as we were building this company, the two public companies ended up um, losing doctors, stock prices crashed, and the whole, the whole thing was, you know, became like a pyramid, you know, felt like a pyramid scheme. So, I mean, to me, it was such a wake-up call to like, okay, if you're not adding value, like one, one is a venture capitalist, you want to be creating innovation, you want to be moving the system along, you're really, like, why are you doing this? You're really not in venture capital to just make money. You are ultimately, the byproduct is you make money, but it is to transform society and company and, and, uh, and, and make progress. And we were not making progress with this. And I felt like in, if you're gonna be in healthcare, um, I wanna be actually making a difference. Um, and it was the last thing we ever did like that, and it was such a lesson. So you talk about this, this you know, formidable lesson. You talk about some of the trends that you saw that shaped this evolution into health tech and eventually fintech. But what really struck me is, you know, what you mentioned earlier, the fact that you took a year and a half, two years off, you pulled out and really used that time to understand the marketplace, identify where the opportunities, and that sometimes seems counterintuitive in the venture world, right? Um, where to take that type of pause, which could be seen as a risk, even though you are investing in the future opportunities. How did you think about it? And how did also your peers think about it in the industry when you did have that pullback? Right. I think, you know, it's interesting. That would almost be impossible. I mean, it, it feels almost impossible now simply because the pace of investment and the pace of, you know, like we're in, you know, two-year funding cycles, right, in terms of funds at this moment. But you gotta remember, you know, in 2000, the market crashed, and there was, um, there was a moment then where, uh, where everybody was stepping back and saying, wow, we, you know, we just had a, a period of extraordinary returns. Um, the 99 funds were you know, ultimately disastrous for most people. Um, and it did give me the luxury of that moment and, and thinking about what I should be doing and how I could take advantage of this time. Um, and so that was a you know, blessed thing. I think we also had a large fund with a number of, you know, of partners in it. Um, and I, you know, I do think uh, it was interesting because others didn't do that in the partnership. And I was the only one that did that. And I think reset and, um, and set up a, long, you know, a strategy that's now worked for 20 years. How that you you know you said that that we're we're in a time where that would be really difficult to happen. The investment cycles have accelerated exponentially, but there remains such value, particularly when you do see these mania moments in the marketplace, to have those reset moments um, because we see what happens um, um, when 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 that that doesn't play out. How then, when you look at the current landscape, do you see people or what advice and and how do you think about even your own organization? taking those moments to pause, mm -hmm. to step back, to set the strong foundation so you don't have a pyramid in the future or market activity that's not sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, look, I think um, as, as we think about our strategy, I mean, you, you just have to be thinking about 10 and 10, you know, 10, 20 year kinds of strategies when you're investing. Um, and I think it's very easy, uh, you know, just, Give you an example. Um, you know, right now, you know, neo banks, you know, are the new exciting thing, in, you know, in fintech. Um, and part of the, you know, the stepping back is simply like if you think about a neo bank and and the reinvention of what's going on in the financial services world in banking. Um, you know, this is, I think, a transformative moment uh, where people are not going to the, you know, the local B of A. You know, they are getting on virtually. They are setting up their bank accounts. They're going to doing you know, lending and their debit cards and you know, all the services can essentially be you know, brought to you virtually. So I think that is a long-term trend, um, but it's also something where you know, companies with a million and a half people you know, are, have signed up 
Uh, you know, I'm just giving you an example. You know, one company, a million out of people, and they've just done a two billion dollar round, and the company's doing ten million in revenue. You know, I mean, so I think for me, what's actually going on is I think there are so many unbelievable opportunities, whether it's life sciences, healthcare, IT, financial services. But value, you know, it's we're we're kind of back in bubble territory in valuations, and I think that that's the risk of this moment. It's not that I've never seen a more extraordinary moment of my 30 years of investing than now in terms of opportunity. Uh, I think it's just figuring out like where where's the value, and in, you know, investing in those places where where the value is. So share a little about, sir. We talked about the 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 you know how you the the forces that shape the approach that you've taken today. I would love you to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the market dynamics that you think are, are fundamental in the healthcare arena, fintech, and some of the threads and how that plays out in, in industries. Mm -hmm. When you look at the opportunities today and some of the more transformative forces and, and, and perhaps ones that we may spend a little bit less time on, what are the ones that you're watching and thinking about, particularly ones that others may not pay the type of attention that you think they should be paying to it? Well, we've always said, I mean, I think the, you know, the places we've made the most impact, the places we've made the most money, you know, are, I want to say, you know, somewhat contrarian place. It's, it's not where everybody else is. Um, and I think, you know, everybody knows what the trends are. Um, but as we think about where we are, um, you know, Medicare Advantage, for example, has been an amazing opportunity um, to be either be a Medicare Advantage plan or, you know, to provide services to Medicare Advantage um, the Medicare Advantage population because that is where the cost is and you have, you know, right now you have 20 million more people in the next 10 years entering into to Medicare and, and many most of those actually going into Medicare Advantage now. Um, and as you think about managed care around Medicare, um, we want to be, like, we're not as interested in 25-year-olds in healthcare. We're much more interested in where the deep problem, like where's the cost in society? The cost is in elderly population, the cost is in chronics, you know, where can we make an impact? Um, and so, you know, MA has been a really fertile ground uh, for us. We just we had an investment in a palliative care company and it was simply taking, you know, a model that is, it was broken uh, in hospice and saying, okay, how do you, how do you get health plans to pay for a virtual and in-home palliative care that will be much more, uh, you know, for caregivers and for patients in the home, a much more satisfying experience, uh, as well as you know, dramatically lower cost. Um, and we, you know, convinced health plans to actually pay this company to take care of patients. And you know, it's anywhere from a three to six to one ROI. Um, and the patients that we called, 85% uh, signed up for the service. It was like, here, we're a free service. We don't say, this is palliative care. You're going to you know, die in the next year. It is, this is a service that's provided for free from your health plan, um, and we are gonna help you know, take care of you. Instead of calling 911, call us. Because it's all about, frankly, keeping people out of hospitals, and nobody wants to be in the hospital at that moment in time. Um, so that was, you know, that was an extraordinary experience. CMS, we ended up selling that company to Anthem last year, but CMS has standardized on this. And there's now a reimbursement code that they just came out with last week that will now be applied universally across the country in Medicare fee-for-service. So it's like, these, the Medicare Advantage is like the, it is an innovation layer that then CMS can learn from and then apply across the population. And this is something, I mean, interesting, you know, AI and ML is being applied in almost every one of our companies, whether it's healthcare or fintech. Um, and this is an algorithm, you know, they create an algorithm looking at health, uh, health claims data of the health plans uh, that, that literally tells them, like, who is most likely to pass in the next 12 to 18 months. You talk about that, that your investments are contrarian. I, I do want to spend some time talking about those areas of opportunities yeah. and unmet needs um, that you guys are addressing. But oftentimes, these unmet needs are very recognizable in the system, right? Huge costs, keeping people healthy, but they're not necessarily sexy areas, right? right. I mean, something yeah. that we, we talk about. Healthcare is sexy, I don't know, life sciences. I, well, something we're, 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 we talk we're, about, though, yeah. is that, that sometimes talent and capital goes to areas right. where there's been sort of previous right. momentum or activity right. or buzz. And something like, you know, Medicare or Medicaid, where you see big opportunities, right. Right. are areas that haven't had the type of talent and resources right. to meet the demand and the needs right. to take cost out of the system. Why do you think that is? And how do we start to sort of shift 
minds and opportunities to right. really tackle yeah. these big problems, but also tackle where significant returns can be made. I think that I think the shift has been made. Um, you know, sort of. You know, one I will say, Medicaid. Most people say, "Oh my God, Medicaid! You know, the margins aren't there. It's not that interesting." But from what we do and what we're thinking about, and frankly, most private equity firms would say we have no interest in Medicaid. It's state by state. There are different rules in every state. Um, if you think about it, we're very interested in Medicaid because that is the sickest of the sick. We're interested in social determinants. We're interested um, in sort of stitching together lower cost solutions that uh, provide better care for people. So we think that's a really interesting you know, counterplay. Um, and uh, we think it's going to be an incredible opportunity. The great thing is in the last five years, and I know, and I have to give credit to, there are many things the Affordable Care Act did not accomplish. Um, and if you think about it, you know, it was, it was really billed as this is going to create more access. And you think about it, everybody talks about the exchanges. You know, we're talking about 7 million people on the exchanges. I mean, this is, it has created more access, but it was really Medicaid expansion that did that far more than exchanges. And exchanges, we all know, you know, are not providing affordable, you know, care. We, we've got to fix it. Um, but I think what it did do was it signaled a moment. You know, it, it talked about value-based care. Um, uh, obviously, pre-existing conditions were incredibly important uh, part of that. But it was really sort of a signal, and it was an incredible signal to millennials. Because we did not, you know, I, 10 years ago, I was backing old white guys in healthcare. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's who we were backing, because that were, those were people, and frankly, FinTech, you know, out of banking and out of healthcare, that had experience in the industries that we were in. Um, and young people were, you know, excited about life science companies, um, but they weren't very really excited about healthcare IT or tech-enabled solutions in healthcare. Um, and the cool thing that's happened is, I mean, one great thing about millennials is they're very mission-driven. And I think the Affordable Care Act was a call to action. Um, and it was a call to action around value-based care, and it was a call to action to, to young people say, wow, okay, and, and it created actually fear in the system. And, and fear is a really good thing for legacy players. I mean, pushing health plans, pushing providers to say, we, like, we're just gonna try to run fee-for-service you know, forever, but there's, there's this wind, you know, there's this thing coming at us, you know, trains coming at us, and we gotta do something about this. And I think every time that there's another impetus and another piece of fear in the system, it's all good, because we need to have pressure on cost, we need to have pressure on financial alignment. And the, and the greatest thing that's happened is this, like this palliative care company, this is a Harvard Rhodes Scholar who had never worked in a company who was legislative aide to Bill Frist, Senator Bill Frist, whose brother was a palliative care doc, and he got this idea and he started this company with us. Um, so like he never would have been in healthcare before. Um, and so there, there are an incredible number of talented young people, tech talent, I mean, we have to have tech talent to do these companies, right, in fintech and healthcare. And engineers, you know, they don't want to, they don't necessarily want to do the next ad tech deal. They actually want to do something that makes a difference. So we, we love our spaces for that so you're, you're seeing this sort of new wind of, of talent um, and entrepreneurial activity coming from places that didn't exist before, but it's also occurring in industries that are incredibly regulated. And, you know, you have this really inter interesting intersection between fintech and healthcare, two industries that were decades behind others, two industries that re remain very, very challenging to navigate and push through, juxtaposed with this, this influx of talent who are maybe from outside the sector, right. but it still is complicated to navigate. Right. And I would imagine too, as a venture capitalist, you know, you, you're also investing in companies that are sometimes at the mercy of these regulatory environments, and particularly now, there are oftentimes shifts or signals that can have a profound impact um, in, in terms of how we think about where the opportunity is, um, and, and from a policy perspective, mm -hmm. in these spaces. How do you navigate it? Is it front and center, or do you, do you continue to do what you do mm -hmm. and let those forces play out on the sidelines? Yeah. I mean, one thing we found since I used to invest in life sciences and, and then started doing tech-enabled solutions in healthcare th is that there's actually less, uh, those are less similar than tech-enabled services in healthcare and in fintech. So I will say, from that standpoint, as a fund, it's easier to manage those two businesses because the business models of these, you know, SaaS, uh, SaaS and SaaS, we call it, you know, um, Obviously, it's um, software-enabled services, as Jonathan Bush always said about um, Athena Health, because it's actually services dealing with 
uh, software and then software uh, as a service in SaaS companies. Those, those models exist, you know, obviously, in healthcare and fintech. We love the fact that both these are highly regulated areas. We think that's part of our differentiation and part of our value add. Um, and if you, just because if you understand, like we spend a lot of time understanding exactly what's going on in the regs and what's going on in terms of healthcare uh, policy in general. And I was a political science major. I mean, I love this, you know, like thinking about what's going on in the macro environment and the micro environment and playing those out is really important. Um, and we don't, like we've never had, we have never had a company fail because of regular, you know, knock on wood, regulatory issues. Because we, we, we like, this is why I love our mantra in healthcare. If we're lowering costs and improving quality, like, what is going to go against that, right? And if you're providing solutions, like, almost in every, in a recessionary environment, in a great economic environment, and, you know, whatever, you know, uh, rules they throw at us, it tends to work out. Um, so, so far, so good. I know it was very funny because we had our, Two years ago, we had our annual meeting um, the day after Trump was elected. And besides a lot of drinking going on, um, they, we were asked the question, you're like, well, how many slides did you have to change? What are you thinking? You know, it was the Affordable Care Act. And we were like, not a one. You know, we are going to be fine. Like, everything we're doing is in place. We don't make bets on um, different uh, ways that reimbursement for subacute, you know, post acute care is. You know, that's just not the way we make money. You've talked about some of the areas where you'd like sort of some of the bigger questions to be answered. So it's not sort of the, the younger population, it's elderly, which are huge costs in the system, yeah. staying healthy. Behavioral health is another um, thing that you're passionate about, as is um, you know, creating an ecosystem for primary care physicians to, to thrive and to have more of them. Mm -hmm. When you look at the landscape today, though, given those yeah. huge mm -hmm. needs, right, we'll have, that we'll have seismic shifts yeah. um, in the current healthcare landscape. What are areas that you see that are overheated, where you see entrepreneurs coming mm -hmm. to you and you mm -hmm. say, if I have to see one more company on X, Y, or Z, mm -hmm. in terms of the opportunity cost of that talent and that capital mm -hmm. going to these bigger problems, mm -hmm. what are those overheated mm -hmm. moments? Well, I think, I mean, there, there are two areas. One is, um, one happened uh, just because technology investors started playing in healthcare. And we, you know, we'd invest in something called Benefit Focus, which became uh, one of the largest sort of benefit management uh, software companies. Um, and a company called Castlight, you know, which has had its issues. And this is a company that brought transparency. And I sort of blame Castlight because this was a company that sold uh, to the, also to the benefits department and for, to employers. Um, and if you think about the employer market in general, most of these solutions were going to the benefits department. Um, you know, Cashlight had this extraordinary IPO. You know, the company was doing, I don't know, say 20 million in revenues and the, you know, went to over a billion dollar market cap. Um, and so, frankly, all the Silicon Valley has this tendency to, you know, sort of like, oh my gosh, this is a really interesting area. Let's all invest simultaneously in the same thing. Um, and so tech investors came into healthcare saying, well, we've invested in Salesforce, we've invested in other SaaS companies, we can sell to the, you know, we'll create, we can invest in healthcare too, we'll, we'll find things to invest. Literally 300 companies were invested in the last five years selling into the benefits departments. So it's become like the next shiny new object in the benefits departments and HR departments of employers. Um, and it was funny, it was after, uh, after Castlight that we actually pulled back from investing. So we've only made one investment in the last five years in solutions that are sold to <coughs> employers. Um, because employers got inundated and they tend to like buy the next shiny object and then that didn't really do anything and they drop that company and they move on you know, to the next one because they're looking for things that lower cost, but they're really not. They're, you know, if you think about, uh, this is not bought by the CFO of the corporation. We're in a full employment environment. They just wanna keep their employees happy. Um, so the way they keep their employees happy is by not like asking much of them from a healthcare perspective. <laughs> They're really not trying to lower costs. They're just trying to keep them in the company. You know, you mentioned that sort of in, in venture, um, if there's a if there's a moment, there's a flock, you know, a herd mentality yeah. to to these opportunities. A lot of capital goes into those opportunities. Yeah. Valuations can can get crazy, and 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 there we have the the bubble. Yeah. 
One of the things I'd love for you to spend time on is I know you're not in the biotech space um, with the same rigor, um, but you have a very unique vantage point. And obviously we've seen the amount of uh, venture funding to that space mm -hmm. exponentially increase, record-breaking numbers, um, a handful of, of companies with very significant IPOs, but again, just a few of them. When you look at that space right now, mm -hmm. are we in a bubble or getting mm -hmm. close to a bubble? Mm -hmm. Well, but let's just say bubbles can be good. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> um, you know, if you think about 98, 99, I mean, let's face it, you know, Google and Amazon, a couple other major companies came out of that. And, you know, might, I mean, Amazon, how, how many years did we fund losses you know, in Amazon before they became profitable? So I do feel like there are good and bad things about bubbles. Um, and people lose money, and then, but we can create extraordinary things. And I do think in life sciences uh, in the last you know, eight years, I mean, I think Steve Knight's here, I mean, you know, there have been extraordinary companies created, uh, and there's ex incredibly exciting science going on in biotech. And I am all for a bubble in that sector. Um, and I think it's, it's really the only sector, every other sector has changed dramatically in terms of the IPO market, you know, since two, thousand um, when we put new regs in and the four you know what used to be called the four horsemen h and q and alex brown and robbie stevens all went away you know we have a whole different standard for a public company right now in the tech side you've got to be a billion dollar company or nobody pays any attention to you in the public markets you don't want to go public um, but if you're in the biotech world and, and we have half as many public companies as we did 20 years ago it's really extraordinary but in the biotech world it is still it's not a liquidity event it's a funding event. Um, and so that, to my, in my mind, it's, it's okay, because the people that are playing that game, they know it. They know what the game is, they, you know, it's, and it's a game of winners and losers, right? I mean, they know that they might make 20 to one and one, and they might lose their money, you know. Uh, it's very binary, right, in terms of FDA decisions uh, in another. Um, and, and right now, um, the corporates are playing, strategics, are, uh, which we try to convince them of. When, when I was in biotech in the 90s, tried to convince them that they should be putting their research dollars into bio, you know, investing in biotech companies, not their own, because that pipeline has created so little value. Um, so I think it's, I think it's fantastic. Um, and I think we're gonna, um, gonna create, obviously, immunology, oncology, and neurology. It's, it's the most incredible time in, you know, ever, really. And the, those are the, the, you need those big swings, right, to, to create those leapfrog moments um, around these, these major healthcare issues. Uh, I want to shift focus um, to the conversation and sort of take a step back. And, and as you look at the people that you intersect with in the industry and, and the like, and, you know, we're at an innovation summit, and this seems a very, very, um, you know, high level top line question, but when you look at the people that you work with mm -hmm. in your industries, the entrepreneurs that come through your doors, the players in the, in the ecosystem, what, when you're looking sort of at these, this talent, what sets the most effective innovators apart? Because innovation is a word we use yeah. all the time, um, and it's hard to sometimes pin down what exactly um, each of our definitions mm -hmm. is, but, but what do you think sort of define that? What qualities define that in the yeah. people that, that you Put put your money up. into, or that you collaborate with. Okay. Well, let, let me let me just start, particularly in healthcare, but in any entrepreneur we back. I mean, ethics, like okay, to, the criteria. We have to believe in the ethics of the individual that's coming to us because we ha we are in a moment where also people are uh, have learned to sell very well, um, and. Uh, you know, we obviously have the fairness example, but there are lots of examples right now, and it is like a style of selling. So, you know, the Silicon Valley approach of asking for forgiveness as opposed to permission really doesn't work in healthcare, and so it is something we're very conscious of. From just, you know, an innovation perspective, um, particularly in fintech, but even in healthcare, I mean, in fintech, you, technical founders are, are somewhat important. Uh, it's become more important than it was. Um, because I do think, and obviously AI, ML, deep learning, uh, robotic process automation, I mean, these are part of all of our companies to really distinguish and stay ahead of the competition. So I think technical leadership's been important. But it's always about leadership in general. And what I have to see um, is that you're a Pied Piper. Um, you are somebody that people want to work with and you appreciate talent and talent will come to you because it is all about attracting talent now. And if you can't do that, you could have the greatest idea, you could have you know, a small core team of 
friends, if you cannot attract the best talent, you are never going to be a great company. How do you then attract the best talent? Well, how do you do that? I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a je ne sais quoi, you know? It's like, how do you describe that somebody has that ability for people to believe in them? Like, somebody has to come to me, and I have to believe in them, right? I mean, it's like, if they have sold me, and I believe that they're ethical and they're not selling, you know, uh, something that's not real, then, you know, I believe they can sell others. And part of it is I do see the team of other people. Because there are people, you have to be incredibly confident but not arrogant and incredibly, so confident that you are an incredibly secure person. Because you want people, I want to back entrepreneurs that hire people that are better than them. Like, it is all about that. And if you have a level of insecurity um, and you cannot handle people questioning you, I mean, I want intellectually curious people that love to be questioned and ask a million questions themselves and are not afraid to ask questions. Uh, and it's got to be about that because we just, you know, they have to be learning machines. They have to get people excited about working with them. And it's not about, uh, you know, yes, you know, I mean, people wanted to work with Steve Jobs, right, because he was so... Uh, you know, uh, brilliant, and he treated people bad. But not everybody can be like him, right? Okay, they, they follow him because of his brilliance and innovation, but it, he also treated people in a way that they actually would be hard to keep people at companies these days because there's so many options. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, it's just, it's talent, 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 treating it well, and people being excited about a mission and believing in you as a person and believing in the mission. So two, two last questions before we open it up to the audience. Um, you know, you talk about the, the fact that you have to, these leadership skill sets that you need to always be able to attract talent and promote and, and inspire talent. But something that was really interesting to me about your career and something you've talked about is the fact that, that throughout your career, you've really had to learn to pivot and reinvent your mm -hmm. career, and that that's a defining mm -hmm. you know, factor, mm -hmm. you think, in terms of the success of leaders today and next generations of leaders, mm -hmm. that it is not this linear path, and the fact that you've had these right. zigzags. Spend a little time um, talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, for, I mean, in my own career, I mean, clearly I've you know, gone from biotech to, to uh, tech-enabled healthcare solutions and added fintech to that. Um, and it, one, it just made life incredibly interesting, right? You're just constantly learning, which I love. But two, to have a sustainable career in investing and to do it over you know, 35 years, you do need to reinvent yourself. There's no question. And I, I think you know, 30 years ago, obviously, people would go to companies and they would stay with them for 30 years. That was, you know, that was possible. And it, it is possible today. But the reality is we all know that life is changing faster. I mean, I see it in our companies. Um, you know, you're, you're not, you used to worry about um, dislocate, you know, people used to talk about, yeah, we're going to dislocate this division of IBM. No, no, I'm like, I love being a growth and an early investor because when I see growth companies, I, I want to see like what's coming five years later. You know, like what is coming to dislocate them? And that's what you just like, you have to be constantly thinking about, um, you know, what's coming next and how you, how you stay ahead. And it is, it is a faster pace than 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and so from a leadership perspective, we're turning over management teams. You know, like every two, it's not that CEOs are leaving every two years, but many more of the players inside companies, and they may not be leaving, but they may not be you know, the head of sales or the head of engineering. You know, they may be in a different role in the company just because companies are growing faster. We need to be fleet of foot. You're going to be crushed if you, you, know, you don't uh, continue to get the best talent to scale. Um, and so it's that, it's that ability to, um, to be resourceful and to change you know, and to ad adapt uh, in a very fast manner. Um, last question for you, and then we'll open it up. We heard Bill sort of talk earlier as we opened the session that the theme of today is about relationships, building relationships, and that this really is, you know, in order to drive change, to build anything at scale, you have to navigate and be a part of and connect with an ecosystem. So recognizing that we have extraordinary entrepreneurs in the room and throughout today and recognizing also um, um, you know, amazing um, funders as well. When you look at the entrepreneurs today and the ones that, that, that you come to you, what advice do you give them um, around how to build the most sustainable, enduring networks and relationships, particularly given when there's very short-term tactical needs like right, raising right, capital, right, right. but also recognizing too that life is long um, right. and there are many right. chapters and often right. intersection points later on in the game as well. Right. 
Right. I mean, nothing to me, I mean, you think of me as an investor, I mean, nothing to me is a transaction. Everything is about a relationship. Um, and, you know, in our world, you know, I'm backing entrepreneurs, there's a group of entrepreneurs, I've backed them five times. I mean, you know, this is in the life is long category. And I do say this to entrepreneurs, I mean, just think about every transaction uh, it is not a transaction. It is something that you're trying to accomplish a goal. You're trying to accomplish for your company. But you know how you know when you think about the person on the other side, you know you don't know where that person is going to show up again. I mean, every time you know, I'm, I'm, uh, we have, uh, I think companies that have sold like uh, 14 pair-facing businesses, which simply means we've backed entrepreneurs who are selling into health plans across the country. Um, and you know, in all those situations. I mean. The reality is, is that junior person at that health plan, you know, is then moving to another health plan, uh, you know, and so you burn your bridge because that contract didn't work out with them. They're going to be, you know, the, your next customer later, um, or your next company, or you know, people we all know. Like we, when you've been in the game long enough, it's like everything recently. I've got. I got David Owens here, who went to Whitefish Bay High with me, you know, and he's working with David Shear, who I worked with, you know, as who I introduced him to, who I created, we created three, you know, billion-dollar biotech companies with. I mean, you know, life is long. It's fantastic when these things all come together, and it's all so much more satisfying. So I just say, like, look, you know, you're you're like creating companies. It's again, you get a mission, you want to make money, but it's also about having fun, like, right? And and it's about these relationships and creating community. Um, and if you, you know, gosh, I'm like, we got four behavioral health investments because I'm so big on like what the hell is going on in our society around behavioral health and creating community. I just think life is all about that. And so my advice to young entrepreneurs is not just, um, gee, how do you like make the most money building a company? It's like, how do you have it be sustainable? How do you have a sustainable, happy life? I've just seen too many people burn out in life because they were going after the, all the wrong things for the wrong reasons. Um, and so that's, I mean, it is just, hey, I mean, I think when you've been around, like I mean, a lot of people I know, I know know this in this room, um, it's just all about that at the end of the day. Um, that's so true. I think that's such good advice. And, and the, the fact that you can't look at people as transactions, yeah. um, because not only is it, is it bad for your, for your business, but it's bad for you too, in yes. terms of, of how challenging it can be to do big things in the world, and you need that network of support and collaborators, and because it makes it more fun, right. and hopefully more money. Um, so with that, I want to open it up to a couple of questions. I know there's some mic runners, um, one here and here. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand, and the gentleman in the blue shirts will come and find you. <clears throat> so I noticed that uh, Connecticut is number nine on innovation, and number six on per capita healthcare costs uh, on the Forbes lists. Yeah. Um, in order to reduce costs, the main thing that's going to have to happen is reduction in the infrastructure and people that support healthcare. In other words, fewer hospitals, fewer doctors, maybe more nurses. But how do we come up with? How do we convince the the medical establishment that? to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. We have not made a dent in right. this right. challenge, well, even I'll, with the ACA. <laughs> I'll give a politically correct answer, but a, a true and honest one, given my position as first lady. Um, so I think, I think it's about financial alignment, and I think this move to value is just is so incredibly important. So if you're, it's about how you pay people. And, you know, we have been incredibly focused on primary care, uh, where we have four different primary care investments because our view is we probably, we probably have too many specialists of all kinds in the country, but we don't have too many primary care docs. And, you know, we need more NPs and we need more different, you know, so I do believe in people practicing to the top of their license. So we need, you know, sort of more um, caregivers, including, you know, nurses. Um, the, but the, the point around primary care is, if you incent primary care docs to manage their patients, then they're thinking about whether they're going in the hospital or whether they're going outpatient or whether they're using, uh, I don't know, LabQuest versus maybe the, you know, the local hospital lab service, which might be 10 times as expensive. Um, and so I do think if you get financial alignment around value-based payment, if you global cap at the primary care level and you give 
a pra you know, practices the tools to care manage in the right way and have care coordination, we will get there. Um, I, you know, if you think about the whole long, uh, you know, long-term care industry, right? There's a massive amount of money in, in uh, long-term care. If you think about Medicaid, a third, you know, of Medicaid costs are really nursing homes, right? And, and long-term care. Um, so we've got to look at all of that in terms of just the financial incentives around keeping people in the home, virtual care, um, and primary care driving, driving it. And I think that will, you know, this isn't a hammer thing. This is more of a Organically, if you align the dollars in the right way, then we, we're going to do the right things in terms of the care given. Yeah. Great. I think we have time for one more question over here. Thank you. It was great. Um, I want to comment on the fact that in, for some of us, I am professor of medicine and infectious disease here at Yale, that the second probably biggest danger to humanity after global warming is probably the emergence of uh, drug-resistant uh, bacteria, viruses, fungal mm -hmm. pathogens, protozoa. And yet, we don't see much VC funding in that sector. What, what, what do you think? Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, OK, so I'm, I'm not investing in drugs myself. So um, I do feel like we, there, are, there are things we can do from the, um, care, from the healthcare system itself in terms of the use and abuse of um, uh, prescription of antibiotics, um, and I think you know that goes that goes back to sort of how we focus on care management. Um, from an investment directly into that area, I don't know. Is Steve Knight here? Uh, I thought you. Do you have a comment on that? Because you know that a lot better than I do. So I, I think that that is the that that is a big issue. I, I think it's something that um, we've funded antibiotic companies uh, in the past. It is just um, right now the return is not justifying uh, the investment, and so it's a societal problem, um, and it is something that really requires a, a solution, and it's something that. We, we, we talk about, I, I haven't heard a good solution yet. I suspect that it might involve, um, I, I think the governor mentioned uh, the, the roots of SOM before as some sort of partnership between public and private. And like vaccines, which um, until relatively recently have required, um, except for notable exceptions, have required a, a, a partnership between uh, the government and the private sector. I suspect that that might be true for um, the development of new antibiotics. There might be other kinds of new technologies that are just, that, that may completely disrupt that as, as well. Um, so, I mean, that would be the short, not fully informed answer to the question. <laughs> yeah. but, but as we close out, I mean, I think this speaks to, to, to a, a, a great point in the fact that there's huge potential needs um, across the healthcare system where there isn't necessarily the attention, the funding, the focus. And part of that is because the economic models aren't in place right. to make it viable. Right. So when we think about it, whether it be you know, these super bugs and infectious diseases, or it could be you know, behavioral health, either, either problems that, that, that could be on the horizon and, 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 and major moments, or ones that are sort of detrimental across all aspects of our society and huge cost drains, how do you think about creating and, and identifying you know, these types of economic models to be able to accelerate solutions in areas right now where there just isn't a model in place for it to make sense? Because at the end of the day, this is business. Um, and, and health is deeply personal. Um, but we do have to find models that can sustain the opportunity. Yeah. Right. I think, look, I, the first question that we ask an entrepreneur when they come in, especially because there were so many young entrepreneurs coming in with healthcare apps and consumer apps, and it was like, who pays and why? You know, and unfortunately, we're still there. We're there. You know, it's like, who pays and why in healthcare? And, and that we just have to start with that. There's so many problems we can solve <laughs> that actually have somebody who wants to pay, and, and we can figure out models to address it. Uh, you know, in terms of, like, uh, you know, drugs that, um, that aren't, 
that we don't have an incentive to, I, I, honestly, like some of these vaccines is a public-private partnership. Like there are governmental programs that do support companies when we have to have vaccines that ultimately aren't profitable for companies. So um, that's, it, that is a model that works today. Mm -hmm. so, so really just then pressing on the ecosystem and these, these yeah. partnerships to be able to solve for them. Yeah. Um, well, Annie, thank you so much um, for the time and the insights shared today. Thank you. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Thank you.